This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hey there. Down here, brother man. Don't worry, I'm still here, and I am not your relative. Now, what do you want, mate? I'm the love, and I'm honoured to be spreading the love for digital radio at the Drive to Digital Conference, baby, with its sweet sound. <laughs> It's easy tuning, and how you can listen to it while you're cruising round town in your wheels. Today on Feedback Without the Help of the New Face of Digital, we will ask if it's worth your while getting a digital radio in your car. Also this week... Stripping down science. The Naked Scientists. It's local radio, but not as we know it, and not for much longer. The Naked Scientist is a very good general science programme. But you have to ask yourself, what is local radio there for? And in, in that sense, I'm not sure it fits with local radio's core purpose. But first... Hey there! D. Love is the new face of a £10 million campaign which aims to raise the public understanding of digital radio. And it was born, or rather launched, earlier this week at a conference organised by Digital Radio UK, the body responsible for leading the digital radio switchover. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're here to celebrate the radio and, indeed, the car. And, uh, of course... The great and allegedly good were there, from Digital Minister Ed Vasey to Top Gear presenter James May, who admitted that even he doesn't have a digital radio in his car. And at the conference, Peter Davis, Ofcom's head of radio, confirmed that the industry target of 50% of all listening via digital by 2013 would definitely not be met. And it's hard to find anybody who believes that the long-held aim for switchover in 2015 will happen. The government, for example, is now refusing to confirm that the switchover will ever happen at all. Michael Hingston is just one of the many listeners who want to know more about the prospects for digital radio at home and in the car. So we asked him to come and meet Tim Davey, the BBC's head of audio and music, and Steve Humboldt, the product marketing manager for Ford. To begin, I asked Michael, who is a keen listener to digital stations, whether he has a digital radio in his car. I don't know. Um, Why not? Well, I've got a personal digital radio player, and that doesn't actually work very well where I live, which is not exactly out in the sticks. It's well in Garden City. Um, oh, in the, deepest Hertfordshire. Yeah, yes. um, DAB reception is really bad, so there's no point having one in the car because it doesn't work in the house even. Tim David, what would happen if you did have a digital radio in your car, you drove all, all over the country on motorways and so on? Could the person driving the car be guaranteed to receive a good signal wherever they were in the country? No. No, we're not there yet, and I've been very open about it. I mean, we've made some really good progress. We have been putting up transmitters, and we've built out to over 80% of the major road networks. But the last thing you're hearing is uh, from us that the coverage job is done. In terms of our overall networks, we've moved from about 90 to 94% of population. And on roads, we're about mid, coming towards mid-80s in terms of major roads. But And do you have a date when you think that you will be able to guarantee coverage of, let us say, 99.9% of the country? No. What we do is we have a date within two years where we'll be up to 97% of the population and pretty close to 90% of the major roads, all major roads and 90% of A roads. Now, at that point, you are, I think, at critical mass for listening for all the car industry. I think you'll get a much better reception. What you won't be, Roger, at that point is ready to do a switchover. So just to reassure people, I wouldn't approve a switchover from a BBC point of view unless we got to the number you're talking about, which is that final push. Michael Hingston? The other thing is that even if I buy a digital radio, you're going to have to have a significant proportion of other people with a digital radio before you can even contemplate switching off the analogue signal. Indeed. Well, perhaps one of the ways, then, is uh, if Steve Humbles, on behalf of Ford, would put um, digital radios as standard in his cars, but you're not doing that. Why not? Well, we are doing it in quite a lot of our cars, Roger. Um, over 50% of our cars we sell at the moment do have a standard digital radio. But we have to balance, of course, what we put in the car and what features we put in the car with the value for the customer. I mean, customers need to actually want to demand digital radio, really, for us to put it as standard in all of our cars. It needs to become... A bit more of an essential rather than a nice to have. How expensive is it, is it to, uh, for the consumer, the buyer of the car, to pay for a digital radio in the car? Where we have it as an option on a new car, it's about £250. 
So if it's an option, if it's standard, obviously it's included in the price of the car. Mm. And we're also launching a dealer fit uh, upgrade kit that customers can get for used cars that are mm. out, Ford cars that are out on the road already. And that's going to be £200 to have that upgrade to your existing car radio. But there's no question at the moment of you putting in digital radio into all your new cars as standard. We have a plan to move progressively towards that, but we really need a bit more certainty about the timing of the switchover. It's a big investment for us, so we need a bit more certainty about the timing. The other thing I want to bring up is, if you've got the DAB as a standard which is only standard in Britain, if you take your car abroad, will it still work? Tim Davy. While digital has been a bit patchy in terms of the different systems, we are agreeing now with Europe a common set of standards, one chip that will make listening across Europe a common experience. And when will that be possible? Well, FM, obviously, now. now. And in terms of the digital standard, over the next two years, I think we'll be totally firm on that. Michael, you've heard what's said. I mean, what sort of coverage is necessary for you to go and shell out, and a not inconsiderable amount of money, for example, about buying and having a digital radio put into your car? They're quite expensive. It's a bit um, chicken and egg, because you can't buy the radio until you've got the coverage. And it's got enough people actually on, on the radio, you can't switch the signal off. One thing I would say is, I, I think at the prices we currently have, it's an issue. 250 uh, Of course it is, of course it is. But we've had, I mean, having been involved in the TV switchover on a number of things, prices come down. We've now moved to over 20% of all cars being standard fit. I mean, frankly, Ford, I think, and others, they will see standard fit in other manufacturers and I think it will become standard fit. I have to say I think DAB will make the cut. Steve Humbles. We need a real push though. We need something really significant for customers. You know, that why should they have a digital radio? A really strong reason to switch over, something that makes it essential. And who's going to provide that reason? Because the consumer is um, you know has a lot of reservations at your recent conference, I think about a third of people do not see the need for DAB radio at all. Who does Ford think should make the push? Well I think once the coverage is the critical thing so once you've got the coverage there then it's down to content and it probably needs something that's a really strong sort of unique digital content that actually people can't do without that forces them to say right i really need digital radio and you don't think that's six percent like six music which has doubled its audience recently or four extra or all the additional sports networks you can get it, not one of them is this sort of killer application as it were not so far no michael hingston you've got you've got the problem that you can't put the killer content on the digital radio until you've got the coverage so <laughs> it's more than exactly, that it's yeah. the devices as well roger so i would not support moving one of our stations only onto digital i mean that would be a, a quick booking for feedback because we'd have everyone suddenly not being able to listen to our, our station so i have to incentivize people in digital now i think to be fair we are doing i mean things like the olympics extra station we put on digital 1.9 million listeners a really good service over the summer those kind of things you'll see more of from us. We want to incentivise people. And the good news is digital keeps growing. I mean, when we have this conversation, I understand the issue with coverage. And by the way, I think, Michael, the email I need to send you is when, when coverage comes to Welling Garden City, because that's what you're asking for. Yeah. And I think when that happens, the content actually, in many cases, is good enough to drive people over the line. Our thanks to Tim Davy, the BBC's Director of Audio and Music, to Steve Humbles from Ford, and, of course, to listener Michael Hingston. If you have any thoughts on what they said, do get in touch. The address, as always, is feedback, P.O. Box 67234, London SE1 P4AX. The phone number, if you'd like to leave a message, is 03 333 444. Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Of course, you can also email feedback at bbc.co.uk and you can join the conversation, as they say, on Twitter right now by following at BBCR4Feedback. All those details are on our website. You, the listeners, do have your uses. For example, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to hear this. Ah, uh, that will sound very familiar to people of my age. However, the majority of listeners are probably totally baffled. So here's what it is. Music while you work this morning is played by the Jack M. Blow Sextet. Ah, a moment while I wipe the tear from my eye. That was the gentle sound of a stalwart of the BBC's light programme, Music While You Work. First broadcast in 1940, it was piped onto the factory floors to boost workers' morale as they did their bit for the war effort and proved so popular that it continued until 1967. Well, of course, I heard it for the first time.
Now, the only reason we can hear it again is thanks to you, the listener, and a project which has you at the heart of it, the Listener's Archive. It's asking you to root through the attic, under the stairs and in the garage to dig out any old radio recordings you might have made to help plug the considerable gaps in the archives. These will feature in special programmes to be broadcast on Radio 2 on Wednesday the 14th of November, that's the day Auntie turns 90, and on BBC Six Music. Now, a few weeks ago, feedback went along to meet the team busily sifting through your many submissions. But first, we spoke to dedicated listener Brian Reynolds. I had an interest in light music all my life, ever since I was a child. And one of the programmes that I really latched onto was Music While You Work. And uh, I started recording it about 1955, 56, when I was about 12 or 13, I suppose. Got my first tape recorder. And it was, in fact, recording well, up to the programme's demise in 1967, so I've got some 600 programmes spanning those years. And I never get tired of them. In fact, I was playing a broadcast only at lunchtime today, and when you've got about 600 of them, you, you don't get to hear them very often, so they come up fresh each time. I'm glad to have been able to provide something for the BBC archives, because... I reckon that the present generation have no idea what radio was like back in the 50s because it was so very, very different. It would be nice if some of them were perhaps rebroadcast sometimes. Um, so that was 1111 with Simon Bates. It's a programme from Liverpool about the Beatles. Um, welcome to the Listener's Archive, um, Tech Hub the HQ. Uh, this is where all the uh, envelopes are coming in. Look, all the jiffy envelopes from various BBC, local radio and national radio stations. Which is, I don't know, it's not fair, really. What's that? You're sending my little voice up. I'm Trevor Dan, and I'm the director of the BBC Listener's Archive. That's fair, And what, what quality are they in? They should all be pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty sure... The- I'm Heather Davies. I'm the producer of the Six Music Listener's Archive programme. In the early days of the BBC, tape for recording was incredibly expensive and it would be impossible for them to record everything. So they saved things that they felt were important at the time. So a lot of kind of things that were to do with royalty or to do with parliament or to do with major wars or historical events they saved. But what they didn't save were things like music while you work or Children's Hour, and those kind of early 50s programmes which were very much about the cultural fibre of the UK and we felt that there was this potential for the listener to really contribute something to the BBC and to kind of restore missing items to the archive. Get those files and then transfer them. This is Peter Shevlin, who's kind of managing the um, archive transferal team here at BBC Maida Vale. Well, actually, one of the worst condition ones was uh, Nico over here, was recording in John Peel. Was it this chap down here that sent it in? Yep. Let's just see. So it's David Roberts. He's in Bristol. And, yeah, he sent in this John Peel's Top Gear, and, and I think there's nothing in the archive that's from this point in time. And this is John Peel's show, I, I believe. But, but the, the amount of hiss that was on it was, was just incredible. So, um, so Nick has done a really good job in cleaning it up. One of my favourite groups in the whole world, that probably a great number of people have never heard of, Captain Beefheart and his magic band. And I'd like to play this one especially for Shirley. With well, I was recording. getting ready for work one morning and listened to the Today programme and somebody was talking about the Listener Archive project. My motivation really was, gosh, at last they might be of some use to somebody. <laughs> Recorded at our operating level. Well, I used to record from the radio particularly John Peel's Top Gear. I recorded them on a reel-to-reel tape recorder, which I built myself because uh, I couldn't afford the sort of domestic uh, tape recorders which were around at the time. So uh, having them uh, in a safe home and that they are valued is tremendous. There are many fabulous groups over on the West Coast, aren't there, John, you know, who are doing so many different things? There are indeed beautiful groups, and they all have nice things to do, and none of them ever get heard, except, of course, on Top Gear. Except, of course, on Top Gear, yeah. right. Just look at this great big bag of stuff here, look. Look, absolutely full of cassettes. Now, it says here, story of recording, 
A neighbour died. Leonard helped clear out the neighbour's flat and saved these tapes from being destroyed. And then it says, rather sadly, he doesn't want them back. I hope that the listeners feel that they are making a contribution to the story, not only of the BBC, not only of broadcasting, but of the society that they lived and live in. And I think that people who are sending us material very often do feel that they're making a pretty serious contribution to historical research. Sadly, no one sent us an old copy of feedback, but it could only be a matter of time. Yellow Brick Road from Captain Beefheart and his magic van. Our thanks to Trevor Dan, Heather Davis and the rest of the team and to listener Dave Roberts and Brian Reynolds who represent all those who had more sense than the BBC when it came to preserving the past. Now, lots of listeners will have preserved Danny Baker's extraordinary on-air rant after he found out his Radio London show was to be axed. Nobody from this station called me personally at all. Many of you also shared his outrage. My name is Russell Hudson. There's no other show like it. It's totally unique, as is Danny as a broadcaster. I think it's an innovative and interesting show, um, and I really don't understand why he's been sacked. It seems a very strange decision to me. The BBC says it regrets Danny Baker's decision to walk out on the programme, which had several more editions to run before it, and Mr Baker was silenced if indeed such a thing is possible. They insist that the decision to cut the show was not driven by a desire to make savings, but in order to refresh the schedules. But now for news of another local radio programme facing the chop. The Naked Scientists. My name is Andy Masson from Coventry. I'm very disappointed to hear that uh, BBC Eastern are planning to cut The Naked Scientists from their schedule from January, replace it with what I understand will be yet another music programme. Cambridge University, where the Naked Scientists are based, is one of the foremost, if not the foremost, research universities in the world. With all the wealth, knowledge and experience on the doorstep, why would the BBC, as a national broadcaster, with a mandate to educate and inform, not take advantage of that to continue to push the latest scientific understanding out to the public? Now, is it better to blow up an earthbound asteroid or to leave it intact? This week we're answering that and more of your science questions. I'm Aaron, I'm calling from London, and probably the biggest thing I like about the programme is the range of subjects it covers. Botany, zoology, chemistry, biology, medicine. To me, one of the important things about it is that it encourages people to become more scientifically literate. People who are interested and intelligent need to be able to engage in, in questions of science. And I think uh, the programmes like the Naked Scientists are, are very good for that because they're aimed at the interested and intelligent but not necessarily expert audience. I'm Ruth Lewis. I'm a science teacher teaching in a state comprehensive school in Northamptonshire. I feel quite strongly that something that has proved invaluable as a resource for me in terms of informing my own teaching could be taken off air or altered dramatically. Um, if I could talk to the station manager, I would ask them to really consider the value that their programme gives to an awful lot of listeners. I'm on one side of the table, you're on the other. Now you've got okay. to catch this ball. I'm right, I'm ready, floor. I'm ready. Oh, well, that's hardly fair, is it? If you want to have a go at that experiment, and you will be impressed, I don't mean that in a dictatorial way, you will be impressed by what you see, because you'll understand why Frank Lampard failed to score at the World Cup in 2010. You just need a bouncy ball and a table to have a go. Masterminded by consultant virologist Dr Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist runs on BBC's radios Cambridgeshire, Suffolk, Norfolk, Northampton, Essex and Three Counties Radio, which all come under the heading of BBC East. And this week, its many fans learned that from January next year it will be no more. So we talked to the man responsible for carrying out the sentence, Mick Rawsthorne, head of local and regional programmes for BBC East. Although his predecessor made the decision, I asked Mr Rawsthorne if he supported it. I do. The Naked Scientist is a very good general science programme. But you have to ask yourself, what is local radio there for? It's there for a very specific reason, which is to reflect local life, local communities, to report on local stories. Now, this is a specialist science programme, and in, in that sense, I'm not sure it fits with local radio's core purpose. But when I think of uh, Cambridge, I think of an area which has an outstanding uh, record in science, scientific achievement, innovation. So you could say 
that the science programme is particularly suited to your area. No doubt that you're right. Cambridge does have enormously important scientific community and industry. But you have to ask yourself, what's the best way of reflecting that? And I'm convinced the best way to do that is to make sure that we report science, local science, in local programmes right across the schedule to as many people as possible. But let me put something to you that has come to us from Professor Russell Foster. He says, There has never been a more important time for the non-specialists to understand scientific developments and to talk directly with the scientists who are making these advances. Science is largely funded by the taxpayer and non-scientists need to understand what is being undertaken in their name. I agree with that. And as I say, the really important thing for me is to make sure that we're reporting scientific developments in Cambridge and Cambridgeshire. But not to have a special programme which reflects that. Even if you say we won't do science about, if you like, national and international issues, we'll do science as it affects the particular community, you won't be having a specialist science programme to do that, will you? No, and we we don't have specialist programmes to deal with health. We don't have specialist programmes to deal with the economy. We have a responsibility in our general reporting mix, a specific responsibility in Cambridge and Cambridgeshire, to report science prominently and to get that reporting to as many people as possible. And with local radio's audience predominantly in breakfast and mid-morning output, it's really critical to me that we harness that expertise that we see in in a programme like The Naked Scientist and make sure that we see that expertise exposed to the greater number of people that listen to us at those times. Well, now, local radio obviously has been having to make cuts. Is this decision in any way connected with saving money? No, it really isn't. I it, mean, would go, re- it would go ahead even if you hadn't had any cuts? Uh, if we, even if we had the same finance that we have, I would make this decision purely on an editorial basis. And will fans of The Naked Scientist still be able to hear Dr Chris Smith on the station in the future regularly? I really hope so. The editor at Cambridge is talking to Chris to make sure that we do discharge that responsibility to report local scientific developments and that Chris would be a regular contributor. And by doing that, Chris and his wonderful expertise in science and his wonderful ability to communicate it will be heard by very many more people than is currently heard on his specialist-specific show. Well, one of our listeners is worried that what you're going to replace the science programme with is generic music. In other words, music you'd listen to any time, any place, anywhere else. There are lots of channels running it, and that's what you're going to play instead of something which is specifically you know, designed for the listener in your area. Well, that isn't what we're intending to do. But you are going to play records, aren't you? We will play some music, but the really important point in this is that between those records and and between that music will be some local content that satisfies the core editorial brief that we have, relay local information, encourage local debate and reflect and champion local life. But you've got another responsibility too, haven't you, in local radio, which are you are talent spotters for networks. You presumably think that quite a lot of the people who are the naked scientists do have ability, perhaps. Are you going to try and make sure they appear on the network if they don't appear more regularly with you? Absolutely. We will work very hard to ensure that we put Chris and his team in touch with the right people across the BBC to make sure that that level of expertise, that particular flair for making difficult scientific subjects accessible get some kind of airing on the wider BBC. I can't commit the BBC to to precisely what that will mean, but there's no doubt in my mind that if you look at what's going on at the BBC currently about science, there's a greater commitment than ever to high-quality, accessible science broadcasting, and I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to deliver something in that area. But, you know, at this stage, we're just engaged in conversations about that, and we'll see where that goes. Our thanks to Mick Rawsthorne of BBC East. Now, local radio is about to undergo some more refreshment with a pan-England shared evening show starting in January. It's just one of the scheduled shake-ups in store as a result of the Delivering Quality First decisions announced last year. They aim to save £8 million. But bearing in mind what we've just heard, how will a national all-England programme fit into local radio? Indeed, what constitutes local radio today? If you have a view, or indeed more questions, do let us know. 
Well, we're nearing the end of this week's programme, and Tim Davey, who we heard earlier discussing digital radio, is nearing the end of his time as head of audio and music. He's moving on to run BBC Worldwide. We thought we'd take the opportunity to ask for his thoughts on the state of BBC Radio. So I asked him first what had surprised him most in his four years in the job. I think the overall growth of radio and just how wonderfully resilient it is in a, in a world of change and digital innovation, the personal relationship that people have with their radio and their radio stations actually strengthening. That's been a thing of great joy for me. And while I think radio's innovated a lot in these four years and we've had a wonderful series of new things happening the core of it remains that wonderful relationship with the listener. Because, of course, when you, near the beginning of your tenure in office, you took a decision with the rest of management that uh, Six Music would go because you obviously didn't anticipate the sort of growth that would has now happened, or perhaps the growth has happened because you said it was under threat. Yeah, I, th- I think we had a genuine concerns about the number of station, station names that we, we had. One of the things I was very clear was I never wanted to lose that area of our output. I would never subscribe to the argument, you never heard me make it, that Six Music, the output was not unique. Having said that, I do think there was a valid question about how many stations, individual stations, we were operating. You know, one of the things that does surprise you constantly, Roger, even if you love radio, and you'll know this from this programme, is people feel very passionately about radio and those stations, and we are here to serve the listeners of the BBC, not to talk down to them. That's that's a very important thing that we need to do. And another thing, of course, which listeners care desperately about is the people who run what they consider to be their BBC mm. listen to them. Uh, do you have a message for um, editors and uh, people you're leaving behind in radio about the need to listen to the audience and talk to them? Well, it's all about the audience. The audience pay for the BBC. It is their BBC. We are there to provide programmes for them, not for our own pleasure. And I feel that very strongly. Now, I will tell you, every day I read the comments log that comes in when people are giving feedback to BBC Radio. I think all the editors will reply, we need to be responsive. I would say, Roger, that doesn't mean that people will always be happy with our response. They'll say, you know, that's I'm being batted off. But I think the key is to be responsive, open. And, you know, one of the things I kind of regret is I'd love to open up BBC Radio to all the audience, to have a wander around, meet people, because actually I think people really care about the audience. And radio programme makers tend to be closer to their audience than I think anyone else in the media. Without that relationship, we are nothing. And that's not just clichés, it's just the heart of the job. And whoever succeeds me needs to have that passion. Tim Davey. And on the subject of you, the audience, and your relationship with the BBC, next week Feedback will be taking part in a session at the annual Radio Festival. The session is all about whether programme makers really do listen and respond to their listeners. But guess what? there didn't seem to be any listeners participating. So feedback will be taking some along. And next week, we'll tell you all about it. In the meantime, as you're the experts on this, do tell us what you think. You usually do. Goodbye. Country on motorways and so on. Could the person driving the car be guaranteed to receive a good signal wherever they were in the country? No. No, we're not there yet, and I've been very open about it. I mean... We've made some really good progress. We have been putting up transmitters and we've built out to over 80% of the major road networks. But the last thing you're hearing is uh, from us that the coverage job is done. In terms of our overall networks, we've moved from about 90 to 94% of the population. And on roads, we're about mid, coming towards mid-80s in terms of major roads. But And do you have a date when you think that you will be able to guarantee coverage of, let us say, 99.9% of the country? No. What we do is we have a date within two years where we'll be up to 97% of the population and pretty close to 90% of the major roads, all major roads and 90% of A roads. Now, at that point, you are, I think, at critical mass for listening for all the car industry. I think you'll get a much better reception. This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hey there. Down here, brother man. Don't worry, I'm still here, and I am not your relative. Now, what do you want, mate? I'm D-Love, and I'm honoured to be spreading the love for digital radio at the drive to Digital Conference, baby, with its sweet sound, <laughs> its easy tuning, and how you can listen to it while you're cruising round town in your wheels. Today on Feedback Without the Help of the New Face of Digital, we will ask if it's worth your while getting a digital radio in your car. 
Also this week... Stripping down science. The Naked Scientists. It's local radio, but not as we know it, and not for much longer. The Naked Scientist is a very good general science. What you won't be, Roger, at that point is ready to do a switchover. So just to reassure people, I wouldn't approve a switchover from a BBC point of view unless we got to the number you're talking about, which is that final push. Michael Hingston? The other thing is that even if I buy a digital radio, you're going to have to have a significant proportion of other people with a digital radio before you can even contemplate switching off the analogue signal. Well, perhaps one of the ways, then, is uh, if Steve Humbles, on behalf of Ford, would put um, digital radios as standard in his cars, but you're not doing that. Why not? Well, we are doing it in quite a lot of our cars, Roger. Um, Over 50% of our cars we sell at the moment do have a standard digital radio. But we have to balance, of course, what we put in the car and what features we put in the car with the value for the customer. I mean, customers need to actually want to demand digital radio, really, for us to put it as standard in all of our cars. It needs to become... A bit more of an essential rather than a nice to have. How expensive is it, is it to uh, for the consumer, the buyer of the car, to pay for a digital program? But you have to ask yourself, what is local radio there for? And in, in that sense, I'm not sure it fits with local radio's core purpose. But first, hey there, D Love is the new face of a £10 million campaign which aims to raise the public understanding of digital radio. And it was born, or rather launched, earlier this week at a conference organised by Digital Radio UK, the body responsible for leading the digital radio switchover. Good morning, everybody. Um, We're here to celebrate the radio and, indeed, the car... uh, The great and allegedly good were there, from Digital Minister Ed Vasey to Top Gear presenter James May, who admitted that even he doesn't have a digital radio in his car. And at the conference, Peter Davis, Ofcom's head of radio, confirmed that the industry target of 50% of all listening via digital by 2013 would definitely not be met. And it's hard to find anybody who believes that the long-held aim for switchover in 2015 will happen. The government, for example, is now refusing to confirm that the switchover will ever happen at all. Michael Hingston is just one of the many listeners who want to know more about the prospects for digital radio at home and in the car. So we asked him to come and meet Tim Davey, the BBC's head of audio and music, and Steve Humboldt, the product marketing manager for Ford. To begin, I asked Michael, who is a keen listener to digital stations, whether he has a digital radio in his car. I don't know. Um... Why not? Well, I've got a personal digital radio player, and that doesn't actually work very well where I live, which is not exactly out in the sticks. It's well in Garden City. Um, oh, in the, the deepest heart of Yeah, yes. um, DAB reception is really bad, so there's no point having one in the car because it doesn't work in the house even. Tim Davey, what would happen if you did have a digital radio in your car, you drove all, all over the car? 